first on to the conclusion of the Arena Trilogy, which profiles Graham Greene through the turbulent years of his life, dominated by involvement in political causes, which embroiled him in controversy. It was the time of year I liked best, when Joan Lepin becomes as squalid as a closed funfair, with Luna Park boarded up and cards marked Fermeture Annuel outside the Pam Pam and Maxims, and the Concourse International Amateur de Striptease is over for another season. The sun in the morning shines without any glare, and the few white sails move gently on the unblinding sea. You can always trust the English to stay on longer than others into the autumn. We have a blind faith in the southern sun, and we are taken by surprise when the wind blows icily over the Mediterranean. For a man who has reached the age when all he wants is some good wine and some good cheese and a little work, it is the best season of all. I came first to Antibes because a great friend of mine, Alexander Corda, the film producer, had a boat in the harbor, and we used to go off in the boat together. And the time came when I caught a very bad pneumonia in Moscow. And my doctor advised me to spend the winters out of England. And so on tea was a natural place for me to go. When Graham Greene settled in Antibes in 1966 at the age of 62, he made a break with his past. The secrecy, elusiveness, and self-absorption of earlier years yielded a little, and a different figure emerged from the shadows. A mellower, more humorous man, with renewed political convictions. One who seemed to take pleasure in cocking a snook at the literary establishment back in London. It's said he went to live abroad for his health. I think he went for his spiritual health. I mean, it's terribly hard to, to uh, be successful in, in, uh, in British literary society and keep your head low enough. Uh, and Graham found himself his own space in which to function. And, and when he defensively began to compose the legend about himself, which I think he did, in a curious way, it was in order to offer a version of himself which would satisfy people. Green's newly acquired stability coincided with his friendship for Yvonne Cloetta. He had met her first in the Cameroons in 1959, and she was to become perhaps the most important figure in the later years of his life. She lived nearby, she had her own husband and family. She made few demands on Green, yet she provided him with constant loyalty and affection. He was to describe her many times as his greatest friend. An intensely shy woman who shares green superstitions about appearing on camera, she preferred simply to talk about him in voiceover. In spite of his uh, wanting to be uh, a monsieur tout le monde, as it is, he certainly was and remained an Englishman. It, it might look astonishing that he decided to come and live in the south of France because he doesn't look like him. But as he said, that was the only 
town, the only place he was fond of. And very soon after he came, he, he bought a flat at the Residence des Fleurs, des Fleurs near the harbor. Please come in. This is Graham Greene's uh, apartment in Antibes, where he lived for more than 20 years. A very simple apartment. And, and his family have agreed that I can show it to you. I'm Ronnie Chalana, Graham's on the console. Come in. A small bathroom here. A tiny lavatory. And a small bedroom. But, as you can see, with a very nice view. The flat was uh, very small and very modest. So was the flat and so was the man. He used to say, a writer must keep anonymous in order to be able to observe people in their daily life and uh, without a mask. And the sitting room, living room, where he spent most of his time <coughs> writing, reading, and so on. <coughs> it's what we call in France, uh, deux pièces. In other words, it's simply two rooms. It has a warm atmosphere. It has this charm. And you see a lot of all his books, and many of his pictures which uh, mostly were dedicated uh, to him. And he would sit here with his pens, his papers, uh, his famous little statue, and write. He didn't care much for uh, material belongings uh, in general, except for his books. These were precious, very precious to him. He lived with them and they helped him to feel at home. And he said to me, but this is all what one needs, isn't it? I wouldn't like to have a special room for work. I would consider it as a place of torture. I think he became uh, uh, much more irate, much more angry in old age living very sparsely, very parsimoniously, drinking, always drinking, but uh, stripped himself down to a, a, a total lack of opulence. You know, this was not the situation of the distinguished writer at all, but there he was, uh, happy, he said he was happy, reading, going to mass occasionally, but living in sin. He was able to reconcile these things, which I personally couldn't do. But I think he wanted to create an image you know, the idea of the, the, the great man jetting around the world, going to the most dangerous spots in the world, and uh, holding to uh, a kind of fundamental truth in the face of political lies. Green's political commitments came clearly to the fore in his novel, The Comedian, which he published in 1966. It was set in the Caribbean island of Haiti, famous for being the world's first black republic and the home of voodoo. Green had visited the island several times in the late 1950s, but returned again in 1963, shortly after the dictator, Papa Doc Duvalier, had come to power. It was the worst year of Papa Doc, probably, because there were guerrillas in the mountains of the north, barricades up in all the streets in the capital. One of the search for arms two or three times a day, and driving around. The Tonton Makut were at their 
worth. The comedians contained a detailed and graphic portrait of the terror and atrocities under Papadoc's regime and likened Papadoc himself to Baron Samdi, the voodoo embodiment of death. Green was later to claim the book as his first political novel. In the later years of his life, and perhaps especially in and after Haiti, Graham Greene became much more concerned with questions of justice. Why are these people being punished um, so obviously and actively? From then on, uh, with very few exceptions, I think all of Greene's works bring up these issues of, uh, of the link between a search for faith and a search for justice. And um, I think more compellingly than any other writer in in English. Uh, Green has, has done this in, uh, in novels that are not preachy or uh, difficult to, to enjoy. Uh, and it's for that reason that his work resonates uh, with struggles in Latin America. In the closing pages of The Comedians, Green made a connection between Catholicism and communism, a connection that was to become increasingly important to him. He believed that there was a connection between communism and Catholicism that uh, both uh, were concerned with building the just society. And uh, I think in The Comedian, one of his characters says, you know, uh, both Catholicism and communism have blood on their hands, but they do not have water like Pilate. You see, one of these epigrammatic statements, which uh, are supposed to be fairly profound, but don't really yield very much. He, he, he was on very dangerous ground, I think, politically. Communism, my friend, is more than Marxism, just as Catholicism is more than the Roman Curia. There is a mystique as well as a politique. Catholics and communists have committed great crimes, but at least they've not stood aside like an established society and been indifferent. I would rather have blood on my hands than water like Pilate. The connection between Catholicism and communism, I think, was of great personal importance to Green. What it did, more than anything else, was to resonate in the mind of a doubting Catholic who wants to uh, remain tied to, to the faith, who wants to have something to believe in, but frankly can't be moved anymore by the uh, washed out, the pale versions of Catholicism that he'd come to see in, in, in Europe. And I think that... Um, that all this came together for him for the first time, I believe, uh, in Haiti. Monsieur Graham Greene, on a parlé de Tonton Macos, son livre qui n'a pas de valeur, appelé les comédies. Ceci faisait l'objet de conspiration internationale politique contre la première république noire indépendante du monde. I learned later that um, Papa Doc had taken very much amiss what I had written about his country. And he did me the honor of publishing a brochure in Port-au-Prince directed to exposing me. It was in French and English and was called Graham Green de Masque, Finally Exposed. I think it was the greatest honor I've ever received in my life. Graham Greene, finally himself, just as he is, and has always been, a tame personality, the prey to a thousand complexes and obsessions. With the comedians, he makes a double hit. He satisfies his sadistic instincts, vomits his negrophobia, and at the same time, rounds off his bank account. Green's interest in communism was apparent in his frequent visits throughout the 1950s and 60s to East Germany, Poland, and here to Czechoslovakia, where he went on an official visit shortly after Soviet tanks had rolled onto the streets to crush the reforms of the Prague Spring. Nor was he above defending his former boss, Kim Philby, for whom he had worked during the Second World War. Mr. Harold 
Colonel Philby, on the right, holds a press conference to deny charges that he was involved in the disappearance of Burgess and McLean. The 43-year-old former Foreign Office diplomat has challenged his accuser, an MP, to repeat the charges outside the Commons. Mr. Philby, Mr. McMillan, the Foreign Secretary, said there was no evidence that you were the so-called third man who allegedly tipped off Burgess and McLean. Are you satisfied with that clearance that he gave you? Yes, I am. Well, if there was a third man, were you, in fact, the third man? No, I was not. Do you think there was one? No comment. Well, Mr. Philby, the disappearance... Though Philby had denied being a Russian spy in the 1950s, by the mid-60s he had defected to the Soviet Union and begun to write his memoirs. Green wrote an introduction to them in which he compared Philby to many a kindly Catholic in the reign of Elizabeth I. I was astonished. I knew that he was one of the few people who, while not approving of my book, would have had some sort of feeling for him. About that, he was able to find so much common emotional ground. Um, struck me wordless. I'm a bit surprised, in a way, you know, that you should be pleased that Philby's used some of your ideas to justify his own behavior. Why? It seems to me that he is uh, behaving well, from his point of view, he was running great risks for a cause he believed in. Even on his most wayward journeys, he was still a bit of a mad dog of an Englishman out in the midday sun. He made these uh, lurches towards um, great faiths, which were also, by definition, betrayals. He was dotty about the possibilities of reconciling communism with Catholicism, particularly in Southern America. I mean, I think he was totally wrong about Philby. Uh, I said he was a shit. I still think he was a shit. I think he'd have betrayed whatever he'd been given, whatever had been entrusted to him, because I think he had that disposition. But Graham just wouldn't have that. Green's emotional identification with Philby found a fictional outlet in his sympathetic portrait of the double agent Maurice Castle, the central character in his 1978 novel, The Human Factor. Curiously, Green chose to set the book in Berkhamsted, his childhood home, and the place where he'd first felt himself a victim of divided loyalties. Castle left his bicycle with the ticket collector at Berkhamsted Station and went upstairs to the London platform. He knew nearly all the commuters by sight. He was even on nodding terms with a few of them. A cold October mist was lying in the grassy pool of the castle and dripping from the willows into the canal on the other side of the line. He began reading in book two of War and Peace. It was a breach of security, even a small act of defiance, to read this book publicly for pleasure. One step beyond that boundary line, which resembles the line dividing the living from the dead, lies uncertainty, suffering, and death. And what is there? Who is there? There, beyond that field, that tree. Castle looked out of the window and seemed to see with the eyes of Tolstoy's soldier the motionless spirit level of the canal pointing towards Boxmoor. I think it mattered to him hugely to remain indignant, impulsive, in a way anti-intellectual. He always preferred feeling to rationalization. He always preferred friendship to, to a collective loyalty. A total mystery to me how he actually remained seemingly loyal to, to the tenets and the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. Seems to have been the one discipline he, he was prepared to accept at any price. Though his own Catholicism was to become increasingly distinctive and individual, a key element in Green's final years was his friendship with his confessor, the traditionalist Spanish priest, Father Leopoldo Duran. Our friendship started in the very, very first moment we met. 
the nice thing after five minutes of our conversation, our friendship was as strong and faithful as it was when he died. I think uh, a friendship of this kind is like falling in love. But uh, to be a priest, I think meant everything. Why is the first time I say that? Because I think that Graham wanted to travel and to, to be friendly with the priest was a, a kind of a, uh, I would say, a priest ready to joke, ready to laugh, ready to talk about the book, ready to especially ready to be secret hundred percent because Graham had many disappointments with the country. Green's travels around Spain with Father Duran were the material for his last major novel, Monsignor Quixote, the whimsical portrait of the friendship between an innocent rural Spanish priest and an argumentative old communist politician who set off together on a series of adventures around Spain in a clapped out old Seat 600 car. The idea came to me because I was in the habit of making motor trips in Spain with a friend of mine, a priest who was also a professor of literature at Madrid. And during the course of our journeys, the idea came of a book. On the very first journey, I realized that he was planning something. First, because I, I thought he was joking with me. Because uh, he began to ask, and suppose a monsignor from the Vatican comes to Spain and uh, what do you think he would be wearing? What about the, the buckles in the shoes? Yeah, I laughed, but uh, don't laugh no, because he's going serious. So he began to ask questions of all kinds. Till really I knew that he was talking serious. It was their visit to the ancient university town of Salamanca and to the tomb of the Spanish novelist and philosopher Miguel de Unamuno that was the catalyst for Green to write Monsignor Quixote. Green found a kindred spirit in Unamuno, a man like himself, tormented by doubt, and one who shared Green's turbulent relationship with the Catholic Church. Unamuno. Father Quixote repeated the name and looked up with respect to the face of stone, the hooded eyes expressing the fierceness and arrogance of individual thought. You know how he loved your ancestor and studied his life. Many priests gave a sigh of relief when they heard of his death. Perhaps even the Pope in Rome felt easier without him. Unamuno affirmed something that Graham could relate to. Up to that time, Graham really had this Cartesian no notion of faith. I think, therefore I am, uh, a question of, it's the mind that's looking for answers. But after his experience in, in Mexico and, and in Haiti, uh, he was to follow what this philosopher says, I feel, therefore I am. And of course here, feeling is more a question, than more than a question of the emotion. It's a question of your deep sense of faith. I have, I'd say, less and less belief. But my faith says that I'm wrong. <laughs> but this is a very difficult position for you, don't you think so? No, I don't find it difficult. Belief gets weaker and weaker as I approach death. Perhaps it's a return to second childhood. Is that because uh, as a boy I didn't had no belief at all? And as a young man. Because my belief, I think, I wouldn't say it uh, comes back, but my wavering belief gets a lot firmer. 
in the company of certain people. Of certain people uh, whose goodness seems to me to be almost must have some kind of supernatural origin. The habits of his life were always very important to Graham. The small habits that, that he created to both get him through his writing life and through the day, whether it was the martini or whether it was going to Chez Felix for lunch. And all those myriad of little habits were important to him and he would often talk about them. say that he talked with people if they needed him. And um, I remember, for example, he was very much taken by surprise when suddenly, at the parlophone, there was cool talk, asking to talk with him. He said, oh, do come in. And then he came down and met me. And I trotted upstairs um, with him. I, I was a little intimidated. I thought, ooh, no, I made a mistake. <laughs> I didn't expect to, for him to come to the door. I thought I'd be dealing with someone else. And every summer when I went, um, after that first summer, we had lunch. I talked to him about fashion. <laughs> I mean, anything. Um, anything that was happening, he loved. Um, to know, you know, what music one listened to, and, you know. I like gossip. People from whom I can learn something which is completely outside my own profession. Although it may be used one day in my opinion. I'm not using them, but I find that I, I like the gossip of women. I like the talk of lawyers and doctors if they don't get too surgical. last time I saw him, we had lunch in his favorite restaurant with Felix O'Paul. And uh, he said, the doctors have told me that I can only have one drink from now on before lunch. And he uh, had a glass of vodka filled right to the top. And he said, and this is it, the one. And it was almost half a pint, I think. Il aimait beaucoup euh, entendre et regarder les clients qui venaient dans le restaurant. Et je crois que c'est ici qu'il a trouvé euh, le sujet d'un de ses short novels. Euh, Pouvez-vous me prêter votre mari I love him, Madame Volley said. I cannot be prudent. And then suddenly became aware of my presence. She whispered something to her companion, and I heard the reassurance and angry. I watched her as covertly as I could. Like most of my fellow writers, I had the spirit of a voyeur. And I wondered how stupid married men could be. I was temporarily free, and I very much wanted to console her. But I didn't exist in her eyes, now she knew that I was English. I was less than human. I was only a reject from the common market. His flattened on tea was... Uh, it was like a sort of council flat. But, uh, I mean, it was nice, but it was terribly simple. I mean, he wasn't a man for luxuries or anything. He didn't use... Uh, for a writer, he was very sparing in conversation with the word I or me, which makes a tremendous change. 
from the sort of people that win Booker Prizes. <laughs> or Nobel Peace Prizes. No, I wish she was sitting here with a drink at this minute and ordering Tornados Rossini and uh, Pompuri. Je dis, je la firme, je le répète. Je dis la vérité, rien que la vérité. J'accuse. In the late 1970s, Green made a startling denunciation of life on the Côte d'Azur when he came to the defense of Yvonne's daughter Marty, who had lost custody of her children as a result of mafia influence on the legal system. He published a pamphlet, J'accuse, which gave a detailed history of the case. And when it was banned in France, Green stepped out of the shadows and into the glare of press and television. The battlefield for me was now France, he wrote. The fight was on behalf of a young mother, the daughter of my greatest friend, and her two small children. I asked him if it was because he had a personal involvement that he was uh, reacting emotionally. And he said no, that he, that he um, obviously did have a personal involvement, but the thing that really motivated him to come forward and do something about it was the injustice of the situation. Je ne veux pas entendre une polémique avec M. Daniel Audi à la télévision. Tout ce que j'avais à dire sur cette affaire, et qui est la vérité, je l'ai écrit dans mon pamphlet « J'accuse ». Ce pamphlet a été saisi par ordonnance d'un juge en mon absence et sans que j'en sois prévenu. J'ai fait appel contre cette décision auprès de la Cour d'Aix-en-Provence, et j'espère que le public français sera bientôt en mesure de lire mon pamphlet. The lawsuit dragged on for many years, and even at his death, it was not entirely resolved. Yet despite his near obsession with the case, Green was still able occasionally to step back and indulge his spirit of whimsy. Two or three hundred years ago, the whole affair would be settled by a duel. Well, of course, I might, uh, two or three hundred years ago, one was rather snobbish. And I don't think two or three hundred years ago that I would have accepted the duel with a man of a criminal record. <laughs> the winter of 1976, I was surprised and a little mystified to be invited by General Omar Tarijas Herrera to visit Panama as his guest. To this day, I don't know what had been in the mind of the General when the invitation was dispatched, but I felt no hesitation in accepting. I knew that Panama, even more even than Spain, had persistently haunted my imagination. So much had happened in Panama during the next four years proved as unexpected as the events in a dream. It was in Portobello Bay that Drake's body was buried. Portobello is fantastically beautiful. Little seems altered since Drake's day, when the town stood at the end of the gold route from Panama City. Here is still the treasure house where the gold waited shipment to Spain. The three forts guarding the town the ramparts which are lined now with vultures. Vultures, too, were sitting on and around the cross of the cathedral. From the door of the cathedral, one could see nothing of the village, 
only the jungle descending like a curtain, dark and impenetrable. We went to see a copper mine, but Graham Greene had no interest in the copper mine. His interest was the jungle, was the, sea, was the, the mountains, because he was way in the mountains. And there, I don't know, at one moment, we began to say, we began to talk about poetry. And he said that English was a better language for poetry than Spanish. And I said that Spanish was a better language. So he began to recite English poetry to, to, to make through his point that English was a better language. And I began to recite Spanish poetry to prove to him that Spanish is a better language for poetry. And I'm, I think I won. Drake, he's in his hammock and a thousand mile away. Kept them out of sleep in there below. Flung a twin round shot in number to the of bed. Ah, de la vida. Nadie me responde. Aquí de los antaños que he vivido. La fortuna mis tiempos ha mordido. Las horas mi locura las esconde. Que sin poder saber cómo ni dónde la salud y la edad hayan huido. Falta la vida, sí, se lo divido. Chuchu's adventures with Green in Panama were the raw material for a novel Green began but never finished called On the Way Back, in which Chuchu was to have been the hero. Uh, I was going to be the main character and a French reporter. Again, a French reporter. It could have been British. Anyway, at the end, uh, I will, in the novel, I was going to take this reporter, journalist, all the way to David, and there we made love, the French and me. And then somebody killed me with a bomb. So it was, uh, there was, I was going to be killed. At the end, it was Torrijos that was bombed. Torrijos represented a kind of ideal for Greece. A benevolent dictator assassinated in mysterious circumstances. A man from a tiny country who stood up to the United States over the renegotiation of the Panama Canal Treaty, and one who offered sanctuary to refugees from Nicaragua and El Salvador, building them a village, Ciudad Romero, in a remote corner of his country. introduced him to, to a, a way of seeing politics uh, that probably is a different way than you have in Europe. He said it himself that politics in Central America was a matter of life and death. Green was to become an outspoken defender of the politicized priests in the Sandinista government, and in recognition of his support, they decorated him with a medal. I think that his lifelong interest in questions of faith and questions of justice uh, really came together uh, when he was in places like Nicaragua and Haiti. In Nicaragua, for example, the uh, overthrow of Somoza and the advent of the Sandinistas is usually regarded in the North American press as reflecting the, uh, the rise of Marxist extremists. But in fact, uh, it's much more indicative of the importance of liberation theology of the importance of, uh, of this union between committed Christians and, uh, and socialists. I remember one day he told me he had just been reading a book by a Brazilian theologian, and he said to me, it's about liberation theology. I'm a hundred percent in agreement with uh, these new movements which proclaim that the church should take a position for the poor. I see you more, even more, as being in the front line of the trenches in a war between civilization 
and barbarism. I remember meeting him in, in Managua, in the capital of Nicaragua. And he, he came in to, to the bar surrounded by some of the Sandinista, one of the Sandinista leaders, the Minister of the Interior, and a whole lot of gunmen. And he affected not to notice that the gunmen were there. <laughs> Everyone else could see this. Uh, in fact, a lot of people sort of fled the bar in, in terror. But to him, it was just a joke. And he, he wandered around, and he just thought that being in uh, Nicaragua among a whole lot of revolutionaries was a great deal more fun than attending the stuffy meetings of literary people in London or New York. And who can blame him for that? Graham was not afraid of Marxism. He said he hoped someday that the isms, either communism or Marxism, Catholicism, would work hand in hand for the common good of all people. And certainly he was never a dissident, and certainly he never despaired, but he was discouraged. And we often uh, discuss this, uh, not only in letters, but also uh, in our phone conversations, uh, because he saw Central America like booming, discovering its independence, and the church being there through priests teaching them how to read and write, and yet these oppressive governments uh, being threatened by people's freedom to learn to read and write as being subversive. Uh, and so he felt that Rome was moving too slow in this sense of the people, and so he felt it often very, very discouraged in this regard. The Pope, when he speaks of religious persecution in Nicaragua, seems lamentably ill-informed. I've just returned from that country, and I can only speak of what I saw. Big placards displayed on the roads marked, Revolution, yes, but Christian. Nor were these celebrations a protest against the government. Graham Greene is, is highly regarded among uh, progressives in Latin America as someone who understands what they've been clamoring for. I think it'd be foolish to think that people who don't read and write know who Graham Greene is or, or uh, understand uh, his solidarity with their struggle, but for the uh, intellectuals who side with the poor, for people in the church, for example, who uh, have taken up the cause of, of the poor, Graham Greene is, is very highly regarded, perhaps more highly regarded than he is at home. The trouble with him, especially in his later years, uh, was that he became very pontifical about the faith, as though he was the sole repository of its truth. You know, God may not exist, you know, and uh, you, you're supposed to accept that as though it's from the Vatican itself. Uh, hell probably does not exist. I mean, how, how did he know? Uh, and uh, his own attitude to Catholicism never really squared up with the official attitude. Very, very, very far indeed from the, from the Vatican's view of Catholicism. But he got away with it because he was a distinguished writer. На Западе и на Востоке, в Европе. У меня даже есть мечта, господин генеральный секретарь, что, возможно, однажды, еще до моей смерти, я узнаю о том, что посол Советского Союза э, дает советы в Ватикане. К сожалению, это все, что я мог бы сказать. Благодарю за внимание. Russia, being the center of socialism, as he interpreted it, always had uh, exerted an attraction on him. But uh, during more than 25 years, he refused to go there. In 86, things had changed. Gorbachev was there. And he was very, very interested in showing how things were developing. And um, so he got an invitation and accepted it. And he asked me to accompany him. 
oil on one's cheek. His program there was a very, very heavy one. The most moving moment I can remember was the visit to the little uh, museum of Dostoevsky. It was like in his flat in Antibes, a very simple apartment, but with a lot of manuscripts written by the great man. And there, really, I could see tears in Grant's eyes. He was so moved. He said to me one day, I would like, if possible, to meet Kim Philby again after all these years. Green met Philby in his Moscow flat and was later to remark quizzically that it had been just like old times. Graham was perfectly aware that his meeting with Kim Philby would be widely commented in the Western press. Well, he was ready to face it. What mattered for him was the human factor. And he remained loyal to Kim Philby as a friend, and I insist on that right to the end. The great grey edifice of the Osera Monastery stretches out almost alone within a trough of the Galician hills. A small shop and a bar at the very entrance of the monastery grounds make up the whole village of Osera. The carved exterior, which dates from the 16th century, hides the 12th century interior. An imposing stairway, perhaps 20 metres wide, up which a platoon could march shoulder to shoulder leads to long passages lined with guest rooms above the central courtyard and cloisters. Sometimes a white-robed figure passes rapidly by on what is apparently a serious errand. And in the dark corners loom the wooden figures of popes and of the knights whose order founded the monastery. They take on an appearance of life, as sad memories do when the dark has fallen. The Trappist Monastery of Osera in northern Spain, where the closing scenes of Monsignor Quixote take place and where Father Quixote dies, was the object of one of Green's most idiosyncratic acts of generosity and another example of his yoking of Catholicism and Communism. He chose to divide the Spanish royalties of his own final novel, The Captain and the Enemy, between the Trappist monks of the monastery and the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. The monastery had been a place of regular retreat for him in the last years of his life. This is one of the guests' room, room number 14, where Graham Green came each year for about 20 years. And uh, we were uh, talking here normally, sometimes about the spiritual things, sometimes about literature. He was talking always, whispering, because the silence and the peace of the monastery impressed him immensely. I would say that Graham was a better believer than I am, because Graham was a man whose faith all, was always in his mind. Uh, on this aspect, uh, I would say that Graham in this aspect, I would say that Graham was also a very singular man, very singular. And uh, to go deeper to the thing would be perhaps to pass the frontier of my, uh, of my role as a priest. I think that most of what he said about himself was a cover story, because 
the internal truths are not explicable. Uh, in black on, on white, they often look disgraceful. And so he really, he, he painted a picture of Graham Greene and advanced behind it. And that was the nature of his secrecy. Uh, I think that actually um, to let him rest with his secrets is, is probably the most decent and creative thing one can do for him. Graham often compared writing to giving birth to a child. He always said that his books were his children. It was a painful job, but something which was vital for him. He couldn't live without it. Once I remember, he said to me, retirement for uh, anybody is a very difficult moment in life. But for a writer, it means death. In November 1989, Green returned from a trip to Ireland exhausted. Three weeks later, he went to spend Christmas with his daughter Caroline in Switzerland. While she was there, staying there with her, he collapsed altogether and had to be taken to the hospital in Verveda. It was that time they discovered that he had a blood problem and the way to deal with it was to give him blood transfusion. He was feeling like a prisoner attached to his chain because every fortnight he had to go to hospital and to have his blood transfusion. And that long period has been, for him, has been really like a nightmare. As one goes over, that one uh, sees the approach of the wall in front of one. And one sometimes wonders whether it's worth while trying to write another book because one may never finish it. Vous y pensez souvent ce mur, justement? Oh, yes, but not, uh, not with fear. In the last couple of years of his life, when he was very tired, exhausted, by his illness. He took great pleasure in putting together what he decided would be his last book that he would leave for publication, which is called A World of My Own, and is his dream diary. It's a selection from the dream diaries that he kept over a period of almost 25 years. And I think one of the great charms of the book is the fact that clearly he found it a very cheerful thing to do in those last last month when he was very ill. It can be a comfort sometimes to know that there is a world which is purely one's own. The experience in that world of travel, danger, happiness is shared with no one else. There are no witnesses, no libel actions. The characters I meet there have no memory of meeting me. No journalist or would-be biographer can check my account with another's. I have spoken with Khrushchev at a dinner party. I have been sent by the Secret Service to murder Goebbels. I'm not lying, and yet, of all the witnesses who share these scenes with me, there is not one who can claim from his personal knowledge that what I describe is untrue. He said he wanted to die with a pen in his hand. And uh, at the end, I wrote and I said, I know you don't want visitors, and so on. You want to use all your energy for writing. But you know, if you would care for me to come, I'll come. I'd be delighted to have a 
half an hour with you. And I had a very nice letter, quite a long one, saying yes, that he didn't want to see people. He didn't want to see anybody. He wanted to write to the very end. And he thanked me, as he said, for his for forgiving us. The doctor said to me he had never come across such a case before. And when I asked him, how do you explain that, doctor? The doctor said, I attribute it to his intelligence. But to me, after having known him for so many years, I think it's not the only reason. Is that it's... Um, it's hope of surviving, which creates anguish. Because hope of surviving is a kind of conflict with fear of dying. And he wanted to go. He had had enough. He really wanted to go. And then, very quickly, he died. Without complaint, without fear, and determined that time had come for that. I do know that he died with Father Duran holding his hand, because he'd known him for about 20 years. But it was nice, Father Duran was holding his hand. He never asked for a priest to be fetched, never. I think there the explanation is that um, he, the tortured man, the tormented man, tortured by a sense of guilt, had found him in himself a kind of serenity because he relied on the mercy of God to forgive him all his faults and failures. I can't believe in a heaven which is just passive bliss. If there's such a thing as a heaven, it will contain movement and change. What one was crudely trying with pen and ink, the search one was making for understanding, uh, would be pursued intellectually forever but in a far more subtle and interesting and painless manner. <laughs> 